Consider the plight of James Rosen, a national security reporter. As Fox News' chief Washington correspondent, Rosen covered several stories on American policy and North Korea, at least one of which seems to have been based on classified information that he received from a confidential source. On June 11, 2009, Rosen published a story in the midst of a United Nations Security Council debate that was in response to recent developments in North Korea. Rosen's article addressed the question of how North Korea might react to a Security Council action that would condemn the peninsular nation's nuclear and ballistic missile tests. The story was significant because Rosen disclosed that the U.S. government thought the North Korean regime would, in all likelihood, stage another nuclear test in response to the U.N. Rosen attributed his story to information that the Central Intelligence Agency had learned through sources inside North Korea. He went on to state that Fox was, quote, withholding some details about the sources and methods, by which American intelligence agencies learned of the North's plans so as to avoid compromising sensitive overseas operations in a country, North Korea, U.S. spymasters regard as one of the world's most difficult to penetrate. Notwithstanding this disclaimer, the story made waves. It appeared to disclose the existence of a confidential source, whether human or technical is not known, inside North Korea a revelation that must have set off alarm bells in Pyongyang. Fearing that consequence, and determined to deter further leaks on the subject, the Department of Justice began an extensive investigation into how Rosen came into the possession of this classified information. It was top-secret intelligence that fewer than 100 people in the government had access to. According to the Washington Post, the Justice Department reviewed Rosen's activities by tracking his visits to the Department of State, using phone traces, analyzing the timing of his calls, and reviewing his personal emails. The evidence collected made a powerful, albeit circumstantial case, that State Department contractor Stephen Jinwoo Kim was Rosen's source. Here's a, a summary of some of the most salient information all of it taken from the affidavit of FBI agent Reginald Reyes. It gives you a good picture of how a big data investigation and surveillance works these days. Access logs at the State Department headquarters at 22001 C Street Northwest suggest that on the day the story was published, Kim and Rosen had a face-to-face -face meeting. A few hours before the Fox website carried the story, Mr. Kim departed the Department of State at around 12.02 p.m., followed shortly thereafter by the reporter at around 12.03 p.m. Then, Mr. Kim returned to the DOS, the Department of State, at around 12.26 p.m., followed shortly thereafter by the reporter at around 12.30 p.m. Kim and Rosen had frequent contact by phone. Kim's phone records showed that seven calls lasting from 18 seconds to more than 11 minutes, were placed between Kim's desk telephone and Rosen's cell phone and desk phone at the State Department press office. Over a two-month period, more than 36 calls were made from Kim's desk to Rosen. More to the point, in one instance, at the very moment Rosen and Kim were talking, computer records showed Kim's user profile as logged in and viewing the classified report on which Rosen's report was based. And Rosen and Kim appeared to take steps to conceal their contacts. In emails, Rosen used the alias Leo to address Kim and called himself Alex. Rosen instructed Kim to send him coded signals on his Google account. One asterisk means to contact them, that is, Fox News, or that previously suggested plans for communication are to proceed as agreed. Two asterisks means the opposite. In one email, Rosen wrote, What I'm interested in, as you might expect, is breaking news ahead of my competitors, including what intelligence is picking up. I'd love to see some internal State Department analyses. The government's collection of information about a reporter's contacts with a source was controversial. To some, 
the Justice Department's aggressive methods were cause for concern because they might have a chilling effect on news organizations and degrade their ability to report on government operations. As Fox News contributor and New Jersey Superior Court Judge Andrew Napolitano commented, quote, this is the first time that the federal government has moved to take this level of taking ordinary, reasonable, traditional, lawful reporting skills and claiming that they constitute criminal behavior. Balanced against this concern was the countervailing value of efficacy, the ability of the government to keep secrets and of the judicial system to enforce the law. One fundamental tenet of the law is that when called to testify or provide evidence, all citizens are obliged to truthfully assist the investigation. The exceptions to this general rule are few and far between. The most common, for example, is known as the attorney-client privilege. Reporters often argue that they should also be an exception, that they should be permitted to make a legally enforceable promise of confidentiality to their sources. And some First Amendment activists go beyond this to suggest that even the extrinsic physical evidence of a reporter's activities, where they go or who they call, for example, ought to be out of bounds because it is essential to the performance of their jobs. Carving an exception like that into the general law for investigating criminal activity would be a, a new and significant departure from existing norms. And so this emblematic case provided a host of interesting questions concerning policy and law, not all of which come with satisfactory answers. Here are the three I want to consider today. What is the proper role of the news media in covering, covering government intelligence collection and surveillance activities? How should the government respond to press coverage of intelligence collection? With tolerance or with criminal prosecution? Who is a journalist? James Rosen clearly was one. But how about WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange? What do we expect of the news media in this context? Clearly, in America, we have a long-standing ideal that, advocate, that advocates for the freedom of the press. The right is enshrined in the First Amendment to the Constitution. In landmark litigation from an earlier era, including the famous Pentagon Papers case, we developed a series of rules that favor allowing the news media to publish classified information. A traditional view has been to regard the news media as a, a watchdog ferreting out wrongdoing. But why is that? What is it that we expect journalists to do? Is it simply a means of ensuring transparency of what the government does? Or do we think that this extended privilege has a more limited, but perhaps more important role to aid in checking malfeasance, misfeasance, or nonfeasance by government officials? I think a fair assessment is that the role of the news media is changing before our very eyes. The Rosen case, and several others we will talk about in this lecture, reflect the changing norms of reporting on national security. As Fred Kaplan, the Edward R. Murrow Fellow at the Council of Foreign Relations wrote, just because the government is doing something in secret, and just because a leaker tells someone like me about it, that doesn't necessarily mean it should see the light of day. This is especially so if the secret activity in question doesn't break laws, expose deceit, kill people, or violate basic decency. But the balance clearly seems to be shifting toward greater transparency. After the controversy erupted over James Rosen's news gathering methods, the New York Times reported on what it described as a national security agency breach of Chinese computers. The report suggested that the NSA had inserted a program into Chinese computers, giving it access to official communications. Something that, at least on its face, seems like precisely what we want the NSA to be doing. More to the point, as Harvard Law professor Jack Goldsmith wrote, the New York Times report shows how much publication norms have changed in recent years. This is a story about the technical means and methods of surveillance against foreign countries, including our military adversaries, Russia and China. I imagine that the reporters would say, if they did not report this story, someone else will. If these are the arguments, 
it's hard to see what NSA secrets the New York Times would not publish. So what drives such a change? Here, I'm speculating, but I suspect it is closely tied to two other phenomena that Goldsmith identifies. The first is the democratization of news gathering, and the second is the expansion of the surveillance state. In a world where everyone can blog, almost anyone can become a journalist. Where before, mainstream journalists might refrain from publishing secrets that they thought should not see the light of day, now they know that their forbearance is likely for naught. Even if they refuse to publish the information, someone somewhere else will. Likely will eventually find and publish it. The growing degree to which government surveillance is becoming part of our daily lives is leading some to resist that expansion. They push back hard against what they see as overreaching and sometimes get to the point where they think that virtually any form of surveillance is newsworthy precisely because so much of it is new, different, and possibly threatening to civil liberties. I should add that many think that the coverage of national security issues is an exception. Some say that news is moving more generally in precisely the opposite direction, publishing less rather than more of what resides in the area of secrecy and that belongs in the realm of public interest, beyond, that is, secondhand refinements of indiscriminate information dumps provided by Snowden and WikiLeaks. In this view, many secrets that traditionally were ferreted out from those in small-time politics to very large-scale settings, are likely to go untouched. So how should the U.S. government react to these changing norms? Late in his presidency, Barack Obama defined what he viewed as the core conflicts and challenges. Quote, As commander-in-chief, I believe we must keep information secret that protects our operations and our people in the field. To do so, we must enforce consequences for those who break the law and breach their commitment to protect classified information. But a free press is also essential for our democracy. That's who we are. And I'm troubled by the possibility that leak investigations may chill the investigative journalism that holds government accountable. Journalists should not be at legal risk for doing their jobs. Our focus must be on those who break the law. Notwithstanding this nod toward balance, his administration made significant efforts to prosecute leakers as a way of deterring leaks. Indeed, it is fair to say that the Obama administration has been more aggressive than prior administrations, having brought at least seven such prosecutions during the president's term of office. Among those indicted recently are familiar names, Chelsea Manning, who was convicted, and Edward Snowden and Julian Assange, both of whom have yet to be tried. So let's go back and consider a much earlier case, the 1988 prosecution of Samuel L. Morrison, a staffer at the Naval Intelligence Support Center and a part-time writer for Jane's Defense Weekly. Morrison was charged and convicted under the Espionage Act for providing Jane's with a classified photo of a Soviet aircraft carrier. Now, some might say that he did the country a service by making Soviet military capabilities transparent and call him a First Amendment hero. Others might say he leaked classified information to the news media and he was a traitor. The Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals in Virginia recognized that there was some truth to both perspectives. They said the First Amendment interest in informed popular debate does not simply vanish at the invocation of the words national security. But public security can thus be compromised in two ways, by attempts to choke off the information needed for democracy to function and by leaks that imperil the environment of physical security which a functioning democracy requires. Where matters of exquisite sensitivity are in question, we cannot let the ultimate arbiter of disclosure be the conscience of the well-meaning employee. On the whole, the government has significant power to prosecute leakers. 
a power that it has used less than a dozen times in the last 50 years. Despite this power, journalists themselves have historically been treated differently from the leakers. Journalists have gone to jail for not disclosing sources and threatened with prosecution, but there has never been a case where the U.S. government actually prosecuted a journalist for receiving and publishing classified information, even though the Constitution and the law would seem to permit that. Back in 1971, in the Pentagon Papers case, which is formerly called New York Times Company versus the United States, the newspaper published a confidential report of how the U.S. became involved in and conducted the Vietnam War. The court refused to halt publication, something that goes by the name of prior restraint. The court said that the government had failed to show that publishing the report would cause direct, immediate, and irreparable harm to the nation or its people, and it allowed the Times to proceed. But in an ominous aside, Justice Byron White, who would have allowed the prior restraint, noted that news media might be held criminally liable after publication for disclosure of sensitive national secrets. Nonetheless, only once in its nearly 100-year history has the Espionage Act been used to prosecute a third-party recipient of national defense information as opposed to the government employee who disclosed it. That was in 2005, in the indictment of two lobbyists for APAC, the American Israel Public Affairs Committee, for facilitating a State Department employee's leaking of national security secrets to Israel. And that prosecution was abandoned after a U.S. district court, motivated largely by First Amendment concerns, imposed a heavy evidentiary burden upon the government in pretrial rulings. And so, past conflicts between the government and the news media have not converged in criminal prosecutions. Rather, they've emerged in efforts of government investigators to expose the news media's confidential sources in leaks of national security and other sensitive information. To do so, the government has relied on the common law precept that the public has a right to every man's evidence, except for those protected by a constitutional common law or statutory privilege. And the government has argued that the press has no privilege and may even be liable for publishing state secrets. Just as Byron White again helped define the legal landscape when he wrote the majority opinion in a 1972 case called Brandsburg versus Hayes. There, the question was whether or not the First Amendment right to publish carried with it a constitutional right to promise confidentiality to sources. The court rejected that idea. As Justice White said, journalists were asking the court to set out a testimonial privilege that no other citizens enjoy, and that while not being able to protect the source's identity might crimp the news gathering process, from the beginning of the country, he said, the press has operated without constitutional protection for press informants, and the press has flourished. Still, all was not lost for the news media. In his dissent, Justice Potter Stewart argued that in seeking a subpoena to compel a journalist to testify, the government must convincingly show a substantial relation between the information sought and a subject of overriding and compelling state, state interest. Even though his opinion wasn't controlling law, it has, over time, become the legal norm. During the War on Terrorism, the government's prosecution of an intelligence officer named Jeffrey Sterling, who was on the Iran desk at the CIA, shows how the tension of direct subpoenas to a newspaper writer might play out in real life. Sterling was accused, and later convicted, of having leaked to James Rison of the New York Times classified information about a covert CIA program. This was a CIA operation in which a former Russian scientist intentionally provided Iran with flawed nuclear component schematics. Sterling, the government intelligence officer, contended that the scheme was poorly managed, reckless, and might inadvertently have even helped the Iranian nuclear program. 
We really don't know the truth of the matter, but Sterling brought his allegations to Ryson, who published details of the plot in his 2006 book, State of War, The Secret History of the CIA and the Bush Administration. When Sterling was prosecuted, the Department of Justice subpoenaed Ryson and won the battle at every level for an order that would have required the journalist to testify and disclose the identity of his source. Only the last-minute intervention of Attorney General Eric Holder resulted in the subpoena being withdrawn and saved Ryson from a contempt of court charge and possible time in jail. While journalists often like to stand up for their First Amendment rights and sometimes are depicted as heroes for doing so, criminal subpoenas are serious business, and reporters are only human after all. Ryson's colleague Eric Lichtblau told about how his work with Ryson had led to surveillance of his own activities and how that had affected him. Lichtblau told the New Republic, quote, I heard from various news sources that the FBI had been monitoring my phone and internet communications with certain people as part of its leak investigation into our NSA story. Lichtblau said sub subpoena threats from the Department of Justice were the trigger that eventually caused him to quit writing national security stories to cover money and politics and said. While the Justice Department never made good on the threat, Lichtblau said, it certainly made it more difficult to do my job in dealing with confidential sources when you realize you may be forced to testify before a grand jury or risk going to jail to protect a source. But if our earlier story about James Rosen, the Fox News reporter and the State Department contractor is indicative, we might actually be moving away from a time when direct subpoenas to the pre press are even necessary. After all, the State Department contractor Kim was identified and convicted based exclusively on big data collection techniques, notably the electronic trail that he and Rosen left in cyberspace. When I teach journalists about cybersecurity, I tell them that all of the electronic tools of their trade, cell phones, email, web searches, and the like, are evidentiary snares. And as if they are truly going to protect their confidential sources, they need to go old school, back to the days of meeting Deep Throat in a darkened garage to talk without a cell phone or a recorder anywhere nearby. The unsettled question today is whether and when the Justice Department will use its subpoena power to collect electronic records from the news media. Efforts to enact a statutory standard for, for doing so have thus far failed in Congress. So for now, the only thing that limits federal surveillance of the news media is its own self-restraint. Under a great deal of public pressure after the case involving Rosen and the State Department contractor, the Justice Department actually adopted a new policy. In summary, this policy makes clear that the government will provide protection to members of the news media from certain law enforcement tools whether criminal or civil, that might unreasonably impair ordinary news-gathering activities. Policy says that subpoenas and search warrants directed at members of the news media are, quote, extraordinary measures, not standard investigative practices, and that they must be authorized by the Attorney General himself. In criminal cases, the information sought by the government must be essential to a successful investigation and prosecution, and prosecutors make, must make all reasonable attempts to obtain the information from alternative non-media sources. Now, all that sounds well and good, but since the Attorney General issues the guidelines and interprets them, it means that the President's chief legal officer is judge and jury when it comes to the appropriateness of news media scrutiny. A bit like how Commissioner Roger Goodell thought of his role with respect to Tom Brady. So this tension between prosecuting leaks of classified information and providing for at least some nominal public window into national security activity reprises the larger question. Can security and civil liberties coexist? Can democracy coincide with secrecy? The two, it seems, are in a never-ending tension that can't quite be resolved in any categorical way. 
we seem to have to treat each case individually as they come up. All of which brings us to our last topic, the non-traditional news media, and epitomized by the likes of Julian Assange and WikiLeaks. In some ways, the non-traditional press is not terribly different from traditional media. It reveals and sometimes comments on previously non-public information. But such practitioners might also be more adversarial, more partisan, more slanted. Consequently, they might also be less likely to exercise restraint and more likely to pursue transparency as an absolute value. If you see the development of greater surveillance methods and technologies as strengthening the hand of government intrusion and abuse, it's likely that you will welcome the transparency advocates. If you fear the threat to national security they might pose, you won't. The filmmaker and journalist Laura Poitras was both facilitator and beneficiary of the former National Security Agency subcontractor Edward Snowden, who became a polarizing figure around the world for absconding with U.S. secrets and dolloping them out to select news organizations. Poitras won an Academy Award for her documentary movie about Snowden, Citizen Four. In her Oscar acceptance speech, she said, quote, When the most important decisions being made that affect all of us are being made in secrecy, we lose our ability to check the powers in control. That, it seems to me, is ineluctably correct. But it's also incomplete. The new transparency empowers journalists and citizens with great power and thus great responsibility. In a world where, as one American Bar Association report puts it, there are no more secrets, we are all now gatekeepers for deciding what will and will not be secret or even private. So, to reverse Poitras's paradigm, when each of us may be in a position to decide what will remain a state secret, or whether to preserve the privacy and perhaps integrity of a neighbor, or to strip it away, then we also must individually be willing to impose self-restraint. Serious journalists and policy professionals understand the challenge. They give the competing values purposeful consideration and do their best to manage the issues on a case-by-case basis. I have the utmost respect for those engaged in the profession, even when, as is sometimes the case, I disagree with the choices they make. There is a high-mindedness to the serious journalist efforts that deserves our respect and support. But sometimes I think the news media misses the mark and errs on the side of transparency. The journalist and constitutional lawyer Glenn Greenwald helped the UK newspaper The Guardian win a Pulitzer Prize for public service based upon his reporting about the National Security Agency, which stemmed in part from the Snowden leaks. Greenwald went on to co-found the digital news imprint known as The Intercept. But I'd like you to consider a report by The Intercept that chose to disclose a security vulnerability of the U.S. Transportation Security Administration. In particular, the digital news publication reported that the TSA had sent its staff a notice about a type of explosive that the agency's security filters were not equipped to detect. Follow me carefully. There's no allegation of misconduct, no allegation of misfeasance, no allegation of error. The closest The Intercept could come to formulating a justification for publishing the classified material, the revelation of which could endanger the traveling public, was that there was a bureaucratic, CYA-type nature to the disclosure. In other words, the TSA had a problem for which it didn't have a technological solution and wasn't likely to in the near future. That meant we were at risk. At a minimum, the TSA wanted everyone to know that it knew, so that if something went wrong, according to the intercept, it wouldn't be charged with incompetence, just technical inadequacy. Bureaucrat gridlock is a ground for disclosing information that could result in real harm to individuals? I'm not sure of the moral calculus underlying that argument. There are any number of reasons to think that TSA is not doing a great job. 
but identifying and alerting staff to a vulnerability for which the agency had yet to devise a solution reflects, I think, good governance. It's not an example of incompetence or misfeasance. So why would The Intercept publish such a piece? Transparency without audit or oversight or review is nothing more than voyeurism. At bottom, that reflects moral vacuity. It is a failure to grapple with the hard questions of justification and need. These justifying values are replaced with little more than the narcissism of, see how important I am? Finally, it's worth asking how the government should respond to its own inability to keep secrets. Here, let me again quote from Jack Goldsmith from Harvard, who in a speech about the problem of how the intelligence community is publicly perceived in a post-Snowden era, outlined several principles to guide the intelligence community. Here's some of what he said. First, fully absorb and adhere to the front page rule. That is the rule that asks, how will this look on the front page of the paper? Second, stop jeopardizing vital credibility through exaggerated claims about national security harms of disclosure. In other words, don't say that every leak is a national catastrophe. And third, rethink the pervasive resistance to public disclosure of any aspect of intelligence operation, including things like the legal rationale for such operations. As Goldsmith correctly points out, if the debate about surveillance and covert action is going to occur in public, and in this age of new media, the debate is more than it ever was before a public one, then public policymakers including the intelligence community, must fully participate in that debate.